This is The Annex, a podcast about academic sociology. My name is Joe Cohen from the City University of New York. Today, we have a terrific panel. We're going to be talking about the sociology of peace, war, and social conflict, and specifically the topic of human rights and the struggle to make the human rights that we have on paper a reality. And we have a terrific panel. Our first guest is Lisa Hajar professor and chair of the University of California at Santa Barbara. She is the author of The War in Court, Inside the Long Fight Against Torture with the University of California Press. It is a book about the legal struggles that were involved in uh, torture during the War on Terror. It's one of many books that she's written on human rights. She's a highly respected sociologist in the field and currently the chair of the ASA section on peace, war and social conflict welcome to the annex lisa thank you so much for having me i'm looking forward to our conversation it's great to have you next we have christopher nj roberts from the university of minnesota a sociologist who teaches in the law school he is the author of the 2015 section book award for his cambridge published the contentious history of the international bill of human rights historical piece on the struggles to codify these rights in the 1940s and the 1950s. Christopher, welcome uh, to the show. It's great to meet you. Thank you, it's great to be here. And not to be outdone, we have from Queen Mary University, Hetty Viterbo, who also wrote an award-winning Cambridge University published book, Problematizing Law, Rights and Childhood in Israel-Palestine. The book talks about how the Israeli government uses human rights discourse to legitimize uh, violence against the Palestinians and how the human rights community can be an unwitting participant in uh, in these types of justifications. We're going to get into it, uh, but first, welcome, Hetty, and it's great to meet you. Thanks for having me. So before we get into, uh, before we get into talking about peace, war and social conflict we have to issue our first retraction of uh the season i owe lisa uh and her colleagues at the uc at uc santa barbara sociology an apology we talked about the largest sociology departments in the united states and i erroneously referred to ucla as the nation's leading department and apparently that was because i was relying on stale old 2020 data it appears there's a new kid at the top of the pile in American sociology, UC Santa Barbara. Is this is this true, Lisa? That's true. I think in 2021, we uh, elbowed our way to the top for better and worse. You know, we have uh, approximately 60, over 1,600 majors. Yeah. That's like, a, so. you got like a little sociology college going on out there. Absolutely. And great, uh, a lot of incredible students. So... I'm really, I love my department and the students are amazing. I have a question for you because this was something we were uh, wrestling with in the last uh, uh, episode. Why is sociology so huge in California? What is it? Well, I watched the last episode I, and I agree with what your uh, the folks had said. You know, for, for one thing, let's just talk about UCSB. We're a Hispanic serving institution. It's also a public university. So Sociology is a big tent discipline that deals with lots of issues, including things that are personally relevant to people, social inequalities, immigration, gender and sexuality, struggles over rights. And so in that sense, I think students, you know, are some, many students are attracted to sociology because it really feels like it has real world application for them. And others, you know, I mean, like just to give an example of myself, I had never, you know, taken a sociology course until I decided to do my PhD in sociology. So a lot of students come to college, they don't know what sociology is, but then they take, you know, Soch One, which I actually happen to teach, which I really enjoy. And, you know, people are like, oh, this is sociology. And then <laughs> they like, you know, join the club. So yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing how uh, we assume that people really know what we do, but like a lot of people don't, uh, you know, including the people making their way into our doctoral programs. But I have, a, I have a question. If you've been in the conversation, 
you know that a lot of departments are struggling with concerns about enrollments. Like from your perch as one of the discipline's top performers, like what are people doing wrong? What are we doing wrong? What should we be doing to, uh, you know, ensure that we stay relevant and attract students? Well, I think, I mean, my sense is that, and perhaps, you know, Hedy and Chris have a different view, but my sense is that, you know, sociology doesn't like, like, automatically reveal itself to be like a pathway to economic well-being, although it certainly can be. And so I think a lot of schools where students are coming in, they're looking for what, what kind of practical major can I have? Sociology doesn't appear to be practical. And so I would imagine that that's one of the, the factors. But, you know, it also, I mean, it's just, you know, where I think in environments where people can really use sociology as a good liberal arts training for real life, you know, where departments can really sort of, you know, highlight that, that's when they can attract more students. H Hedy and Christopher, are law schools also worried about enrollments? Or Christopher? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And I think one of the big things is there are a lot of questions about uh, what the students, and this comes from the students, what, what are we going to do after that kind of economic investment? Uh, uh, what are we going to do after we invest four years in undergrad, three years in law school? And uh, quite honestly, I think uh, when the market goes down, the students recognize that uh, in the short term, sometimes the, uh, the sort of uh, economic long-term benefit calculus doesn't make as much sense to certain students who perhaps have to rely on loans, who don't have family support uh, coming in. And I think that's something that we need to really address and think seriously about. Uh, how do we support the really smart, bright, talented students who don't become students because the doors are closed or the, uh, the, the uh, long-term economic prospects don't make as much sense in terms of investments and what happens on the other side. You know, that's interesting, like, especially when you triangulate it with what Lisa was saying, you know, we serve students who often come from disadvantaged backgrounds. And some of us approach our jobs saying, well, we don't have to worry about jobs or money. I just feed the mind which is like, that's a position of convenience that you can take when you have the means to not, not worry about money, you know? Uh, so th that's quite good. Hedy, now you're out, you're out in, in, in the United Kingdom. Do you also face these types of pressures with enrollments or it, does the system work differently or have different preoccupations out there? It's had a different uh, issue. We, we can actually, every year we can take more students than maybe we want to take and, mm -hmm. University administration has been pushing us to do that. And actually what faculty is trying to do is to maintain uh, staff to student ratio in order to ensure like quality and uh, quality education experience. But I guess uh, part of the, and this links with what uh, Chris and, and Lisa were saying, part of the broader challenge is not to get enslaved to kind of a neoliberal logic of numbers and think about how we kind of as scholars help promote a society where people where where education is more affordable so rather than trying to translate every intellectual experience into employability seeing how people don't have to worry so much about student loans i know in the uk we've learned some of the bad lessons from the us and student fees have uh, kind of increased exponentially over the last two decades so i guess that's one of the challenges to reverse that trend in a sense, because that could impact uh, enrollment eventually. Do, do you guys think we're we're too focused on enrollment or too focused on the numbers? Is there is that a possibility? I'm very focused on the numbers. You know, if you want to know the truth, like I think, I'm, I, I think that one of the big um, you know imbalances, and I certainly see it in you know at the University of California Santa Barbara and the whole UC now. You know, academic workers are on strike. It's the sense that you know, costs are going up, students are paying more, but they're just, 
you know, there's insufficient resources coming in. And there's like, at least at my university, the top administration tends to always go for the austerity approach, which mm. on the, you know, while at the same time, they're saying, take all the students that want to come into your major. So I, I would say that as, you know, the new chair of my department, my, um, my expertise on war and conflict is going to come in handy for the next three years while I'm chairing <laughs> this department. <laughs> Let me ask uh, Christopher and Hetty, because you're looking at our discipline from the outside. When you look at us from the outside, what would you like? Do you feel we should be doing anything differently? Do you like when you look at sociology from the outside? Are we in your mind? Are we doing things wrong? Is there are there clear problems with how we're seeing ourselves or going about our, our jobs? Uh, Christopher, so, uh, I, I actually have a. Uh somewhat of a unique position because uh, I am a sociologist by training, have my PhD from Michigan. Uh, so uh, I have both feet squarely in sociology. My research is comparative historical sociology. And uh, with my law degree and my legal background, I teach law. And so the, the way I uh, look at my own research is I step outside of the four corners of the law to understand what's in the law. But at the same time, I can step outside the four corners of uh, sociology departments uh, and uh, sort of look in. And I think, uh, you know, bridging those boundaries and looking both ways, one of the big things that we can all do better on is speaking in a way that people who aren't in our disciplines can understand not only what we're saying in terms of the words, uh, but in terms of the importance of the ideas, and I always go uh, through with my students when they're doing uh, projects, I, I make them explain their project in a way that a person sitting next to them on the bus that they don't know at all, who strikes up a conversation and says, what are you studying? What are you doing? To explain it to them in a way that takes about 20 seconds and elicits a response from them, from the other person on the bus, where they ask them another question. Wow, that is interesting. Tell me more, as opposed to usually what happens, and uh, I'm guilty of this. You know, you explain what you do, and after 20 seconds, their eyes glaze over, and you can tell that they're thinking, how the hell do I get out of this conversation? What did I do? <laughs> Half the time, it's my students who are giving me that. <laughs> but, 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 but just being able to uh, really explain in very succinct, compelling terms what it is that we do and why it's important, and then have people come back to us to ask more, I think is something that we can all do a lot better. Yeah. It's like, it's like make, make it uh, the use value of what we do more directly apparent to, to the rest of society. More, more directly apparent, more personal. And Elisa, uh, one of the things that I love about your book is something that you don't see in many academic books, and it's the use of the word I. <laughs> One letter, that first person changes the whole orientation. And we can do that, I think, and still maintain an incredibly high quality uh, level of academic rigor as you've done, Lisa, in your book. And so hats off to you for doing that. Thank you. Well, just in terms, just to coming to the idea of explaining what we do. Like I teach, as I said, I teach SOCH 1. It's 525 students typically. And I always include the last week is on torture and human rights. Because I always tell my students like your sociological education is not complete if you don't have a little torture. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's switch to, to human rights and, and get right into it. I wanted to, uh, a lot of our viewers or listeners are not in this space. They don't really know much of, you know, nobody knows what anybody's doing in this business just because it's such a big tent. So before we get into like Lisa's specific work and and, and yours, Hedy, and yours, Christopher, I was wondering, can we start just with like a basic introduction to like your subfield? Uh, like what, what kind of research is being done by sociologists who study peace and war? Like who do we talk to and what do we bring to the table? And like, why do people listen to us? Okay, well, I mean, as you know, I'm now the chair of the Peace, War and Social Conflict section. And it's something that's, I mean, to me, it's one of many sections I'm uh, a part of, but, you know, socio I see sociology is a big tent discipline. There's so much room for different kinds of inquiries and issues relating to peace, war and conflict really, you know, like 
are raise all kinds of things that are relevant to sociologists, like the role of the state, the rights of people, um, how legal, you know, I mean, what I'm particularly interested in is how people struggle on the terrain of law to, you know, achieve certain kinds of rights and justice. And so in our, in the section, we have people working on genocide, on military um, uh, operations, on historical memory, on, you know, uh, struggles for rights, you know, all kinds, immigration, even like sort of like how immigration becomes a deeply politicized issue around social conflicts within countries and transnationally. And so, I mean, it's what I really love about sociology and what I feel, you know, in something like peace, war and uh, social conflict really enables sociology to be what it does best, which is be interdisciplinary. I mean, it includes, but does not, you know, only it includes, but does not limit it to sociologists. And so I think that that's something that's Excited. And it's also very, you can be very au courant with what you're yeah. working on. Yeah. Hedy, how do you see your subfield? Like what, what does the group of scholars who you run with, like what's your function in society? What are you contributing to the conversation? What conversations are you? I, I try to kind of visit several weddings at the, at the same time. Yeah. So that could include armed conflict. I've been writing a lot on childhood. So at the uh, American uh, Sociological Association, I'm a member of several sections, so human rights, law. And I think that allows for uh, kind of broader dialogues because there are similar conversations sometimes being had within seemingly uh, disparate subfields. But I think one of the things that's interesting about armed conflict and wars is that I think as a as a public, we tend to think of those contexts as being very exceptional, very unusual, very outside our normal lives. And I think part of what scholarship can actually do is unearth some of the connections we might not be aware of. Um, so for example, Lisa's book, thinking of kind of how torture in a way arose from normal law, mm. how it arose from how the military courts, I don't want to say too much because we'll talk about the details, but how the military, the fascinating military courts that Lisa writes about, which seem to be very unusual courts, actually have a longer history uh, of being used and how they rely to an extent on colonial precedents in, in US history. So trying to challenge or complicate um, our ideas about what's the norm and what's the exception. I think that's one of the contributions of uh, sociological and uh, scholarship and just scholarship uh, in general. Christopher? So uh, my research uh, looks at rights and human rights from a comparative and historical approach. And the people who are doing the history of rights, the history of human rights, looking at social transformation, structural change, uh, there are two big things I think that we focus on. Uh, one is where are we right now in terms of uh, the bigger social processes that we have been experiencing for decades and decades, even centuries, uh, uh, sort of placing us within context. But ultimately it comes down to some very basic questions that I, believe humans have probably been asking for as long as there have been humans. Uh, how do we get along together? What kind of limits are there in terms of what we're expected to do and what we're expected not to do? Uh, what kind of boundaries surround individual people and groups that others may not pass? Uh, you know, these basic questions of human existence get captured within the study of human rights and the history of human rights. And that's one of the things that to me is most exciting and compelling about it is sometimes in certain moments of history, I believe we forget those questions that underlie our work and we forget the answers that we've had for so many years past. Uh, and, and so sort of uncovering the history of those and being able to see where we are today, I think is something that really captures the essence, but also the overarching goals of those who are in the fields and subfields that I consider myself to be part of. I get I get the sense from your your placement, yours and, and Hetty's placement, that lawyers are particularly interested in, in what we do. Um, it, I, I suppose you provide perspective or you're able to show how, you know, 
whatever legal arrangements exist in one society aren't necessarily universals or, you know, the stuff that we do. Uh, but could we, could you just speak narrowly like to, you know, sociologists engagements with lawyers? Like, is that a fruitful, you know, field for us to approach? Are there great discussions to have? What do they like about us? <laughs> what do they like about us? I don't know. But, you know, <laughs> one of the things, I'll just tell you, like, one of my, like, one-liners, you know, having studied lawyers both in the context of the first my first book, The Israeli Military Court System in the West Bank and Gaza, and now this, I, I joke that lawyers think like lawyers. They go to law school, they're trained to think like lawyers. And so they tend to think about the value of their work is determined by whether or not they win or lose. So in some ways, what I analogize them to is... Um, warriors fighting in the trenches and sociologists are like the generals up on the hill saying go over there and if you, you know or like think about your activities in this way or that way uh -huh. so in some ways sociologists help lawyers see the value of their work better than they can see their own value oh that's good a anything to add oh, it's, 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 it's so funny that you uh, say that lisa because in my introductory course, uh, first semester students are fresh. I have, uh, you know, between 80 and 100 students in my torts class, uh, which is accidents, injuries, you know, uh, anvils falling on people, uh, that, uh, products liability, that kind of thing. And about four or five weeks into the semester, we have enough under our belts where we can put arguments on the table on one side, the other, uh, you can put arguments uh, uh, on the table on the other side. And it's sort of like uh, either uh, having a, a round of tennis where you're hitting the arguments back or sparring, if we're gonna put it in more sort of physical and the students love it. They love getting into that uh, sort of back and forth. So just as you say, there, there's sort of a, a, a battle that's going on through words, ideas, uh, arguments and uh, uh, foundations of law. And so, uh, uh, you know, that, that that's definitely part of what we do. Um, thinking like a lawyer is incredibly important, but I recently have really been pushing students to consider what does it mean to feel like a lawyer? Uh, what does it mean to feel that your client has been wronged, even if there isn't law to support it? Uh, what does it mean to feel when a client comes in and says, can you help me? I don't know what to do when the lawyer feels that there is something to do or which way, uh, you know, the, 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 that's an important part. And I think uh, all the people, all the lawyers that are fighting these battles in your book, um, they know what it means to think like a lawyer, but they also have a really good sense of what it means to feel like a lawyer. And ba basically, uh, uh, just to Chris, sum that I... up, uh, and, and, uh, feeling like a lawyer means to feel like a human being. <laughs> Jeez, sometimes we questions. need to sometimes we need to uh, remind ourselves that <laughs> Hedy. i'm not i'm not sure we've met the same lawyers chris <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know it's i'm reminded that, that over the years i've, I've taught both law uh, students and non-law students about the law and sometimes students who don't have legal training are very concerned that they won't understand the subject material and actually i reassure them that they have less to unlearn yeah. so they're at a more privileged <laughs> exactly position right. but i think also in terms of sociology of law one of the contributions of one of the main insights of the, the sociology of law is to think about what is law where where is law in our lives and one of the things that i think scholarship has shown is that legal actors are not just judges and uh, attorneys and, you know, uh, Senate, whatever, it's all of us because all of us on a daily basis um, invoke in various ways legal concepts, really, and that shapes the way we think about our social reality. And those conversations in turn, whether they're at home, in the media, whatever, that shapes law because law is the way in which all of us uh, the way in which it shapes our lives, right, uh, as subjects of the law. So in a sense, I, I think the question of what is the subject of the sociology of law, the answer is that it's much wider as well. as, And I think if we conceptualize it in that sense, we democratize it also because we take some of, of the power away from legal experts. They're not the only ones who can make truth claims about the law. So it becomes a more pluralistic landscape in a sense. Right. 
Yeah, I always tell my undergraduate students when we're getting into some legal issues, and we deal, you know, these are undergraduates, we deal with things that are related to, you know, the Geneva Conventions, laws of war. And one of the things I always tell students is law is not rocket science, like anybody can figure it out. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, I mean, not to insult, you know, the no, study really. of law, but of course, it's very complicated. But if you really want to understand law in the world, and, you know, sort of the legal arguments, I mean, that's, you know, uh, to completely comprehensible to non-specialists if it's presented clearly. Uh -huh. Before we move on, I just want to give a plug to this section. So if you are a scholar who is interested in uh, peace, war, and social conflict, why not check out the section's website, pwsc.us. Lisa, before we uh, move on, what's, uh, what's brewing in this section? What are you guys uh, talking about? What are you working on right now? Great. Well, we do, um, you know, these virtual coffee hours where different people who are in the section will talk about their research and it's something in a um, setup sort of like this. But we're also, uh, the section is now planning to organize a, a mini conference the day before the American Sociological Association meeting in August uh, in Philadelphia. And so we want to actually bring people together to really think collectively and, you know, have people present their work. So we're still working on the call for papers, but I hope that people who are interested in issues of peace, war, and social conflict will either, you know, sign up or come and attend. Amazing. All right. Well, let's... I'll, I'll, I'll jump in here just, just to say uh, uh, that uh, I've been uh, involved in uh, Lisa's section and also the section of human rights. Uh, we do a lot of things together. And uh, I, I really believe right now we're in a moment where it's important to reach out and try new things in terms of new associations with different sections, different groups and members. And uh, Lisa, your section is fantastic. And uh, I just wanna give you a plug uh, for that. You do some uh, really exciting panels and presentations. And uh, uh, if you haven't been a part of that section, that's definitely something to, uh, uh, to, to think about. Ahla wa sahlan. Well, let's turn now to uh, the the more narrow area that uh, your uh, work engages. Questions of human rights and the law and, uh, you know, human rights in concept and uh, human rights in reality. And maybe we'll, and, and, and so for Hetty and Christopher, we're going to start off with Lisa's book and just jump in with questions, comments, whatever you want. We'll make it dynamic. But before that, let's just reintroduce the book. So Lisa's new book, Lisa Hajar, is The War in Court Inside the Long Fight Against Torture, a, uh, a, a book about uh, the fight against torture during the war on terror. Uh, Lisa, you want to start us off just telling us about the book, like sure. what questions you engage, what did you study, what did you find? Okay, well, you know, I was, you know, my first, my dissertation was on the Israeli military courts in the West Bank and Gaza, and that's sort of a setup for this because, you know, I real I learned sort of on the ground and from the lawyers I was interviewing, and this was, you know, in the early 1990s, how, how critically important in a negative way torture was, you know, to you know, the workings of the military courts there where Palestinians were prosecuted by the Israeli military. But I also really came to appreciate in this in this very tense conflict, I mean, the Israel-Palestine conflict is extraordinarily intense, but it's also super legalistic. And so it really made me appreciate the roles, the different roles, like both government lawyers and, you know, sort of lawyers who are human rights lawyers or defense lawyers in the courts, really the roles that only lawyers could play. And, you know, so I came to really start loving the law, in a sense, you know, as a sociologist, even though many of the lawyers I talked to were quite um, cynical. But anyway, so I was thinking about torture throughout the 1990s. And, you know, the, a big you know, event that really solidified my fascination with torture was the arrest um, of a former dictator, Chilean dictator, Augusto Pinochet mm. in London in 1998. And, and the way in which he, is, he was arrested was on the basis of this um, international criminal law jurisdiction 
universal jurisdiction that hadn't been, it was invented in the 19th century to deal with pirates and slave traders. And it was, and it fell into disuse and then was dusted off. And so, yeah. you know, I was, so I was all primed. I was already thinking about torture when 9-11 happened. And then, so thinking about torture, you know, I, I could start hearing the dog whistles from members, you know, Dick Cheney, then vice president and other Bush administration officials. And it was clear to me early on that the US government was going to, you know, utilize torture um, as part of their tactics in the war on terror. But everything was like really a secret and for a couple of years. And the first people who started fighting back and pushing against this were a couple of lawyers. I mean, the lawyers from the Center for Constitutional Rights, Michael Ratner, and a couple of death penalty lawyers joined him. And, you know, they challenged President Bush's presidential authority to secretly detain people at Guantanamo. And so that, you know, sort of begins this process. And when they brought a case against um, the administration and they won in 2004, and the Supreme Court said these lawyers, these detainees held in Guantanamo have a right to lawyers because right before that, it had been the revelations that the U.S. government actually has a torture policy. So that was when hundreds of angry lawyers, corporate lawyers, family lawyers, human rights lawyers, law professors, etc., like signed on to represent Guantanamo detainees. So that's like one mm -hmm. track of what I ended up, you know, doing research on. But so just to say that the book itself really covered, like I was kind of like waiting for torture and the fight against it before right. it started and then like really followed it for 20 years. So the book is based on, you know, 20 years of research, including, you know, I made like as a scholar, you know, part of my research included Guantanamo, but I couldn't go there as a scholar. I couldn't write a grant and say, I'm going to Guantanamo right. to do research. And so somebody um, alerted me to the idea that I could go as a journalist. And so, in fact, that's what I did. I went as a journalist wow. 14 times to Guantanamo, you know. And so I do write journalistically, wow. but it was like being a sociologist observing things that many journalists were there just, you know, doing the daily reporting and stuff. And I'd be like, hmm, I think I'm going to. I'm going to look at the role of the CIA and, you know, <laughs> that kind of stuff. So it was very, it was a, like a, like a very immersive process that spanned 20 years in multiple contexts. I got, I got to ask, just tell me, what was it like? I mean, none of us have seen this. Like, what did you see? What was the walk away when you saw Guantanamo? Well, Guant for, for journalists, you know, um, we go down like in delegations and um, it's, you know, uh, there's a, not a lot of appreciation on the part of the military because they see, I mean, I have great things to say about certain sectors of the U.S. military, but the people who sort of run the um, Guantanamo basically were always suspicious that journalists were just there to be critical or negative or whatever. And so it's a very infantilizing experience. Like we have to go everywhere to lunch, to dinner, you know, together. Like it's like being at, you know, summer camp or some yeah. summer camp for torture, <laughs> you know. But, uh, you know, it was just a fascinating um, opportunity because because I went so many times and I would stay for like weeks at a time, you know, to be able, especially, you know, the, the case that I spent the most time observing was the 9-11 case, which mm. has a long and, sordid history and it's you know if anybody's wondering it's still in the pre-trial phase um but you know being able to go and observe and report on that particular case which is absolutely has become the central thing of you know the legacy of the war on terror and it's a you know the case itself is a debacle to be able to see it as a sociologist was something i really i appreciated i could be there as a journalist but i could understand it as a sociologist and that was yeah. some of the lessons i tried to bring to the book amazing well i mean what first of all one thing that strikes me is you know how how this sort of goes against the caricatures that you have of lawyers as you know self-serving and always you know looking for money or what have you you're you're describing a situation where the possibility of torture presented itself and and a bunch of lawyers just sort of rose up as a civic duty right to start using their yes. skills to challenge it is that what happened yeah that was i mean it was amazing it was like you know i mean seriously republicans and democrats etc i mean just you know a lot of people because 
you know, the bottom line was they really felt like the Bush administration was, you know, subverting the rule of law. Mm. And like they were offended, they were professionally offended and then, you know, found an opportunity. But the one thing that's interesting about in this kind of experience, and, and this is true more broadly about the war on terror, many aspects of the war on terror, particularly the way the Bush administration interpreted the laws were invented out of whole cloth. Huh. So the Bush administration was inventing a, a script and then lawyers who are well-trained, intellectual, sophisticated thinkers were also basically like on the dance floor trying to figure out the moves to something that was just being invented and changed. And, and the work that these lawyers representing Guantanamo detainees, and I'd also do a big shout out to the military lawyers, military defense lawyers who like fought the Pentagon over the military commissions. And it created this military civilian alliance of lawyers who's at least despite all the differences among them, ideological, political backgrounds, they had in common this sense that the rule of law must be defended and they were the ones to do it. And so you get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of lawyers doing their own thing and working collaboratively. And it was just a very, it's a very important part of, you know, the contemporary history of the United States. Yeah, Christopher and Hetty, I, 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 you can just jump in any time sort of with your specific reactions either to, you know, America's engagement with terror or with uh, torture rather, uh, and, and the specific accounts and, uh, you know, that Lisa uh, brings out in her book. So either the book itself or the case that it studies, what were your reactions uh, to this, to this story? Uh, yeah, either of you can jump in. I mean, I, I, I found the metaphor of uh, a war in court very apt. Uh, I, I guess in a sense, as, as Lisa was kind of saying earlier, law is always a law in a sense. It's a battlefield of competing interpretations. Obviously, you see a very unique type of legal war uh, in the military commissions that uh, Lisa was uh, focusing on in, in her work, in her book, even though the book is not exclusively about the military commissions or about Guantanamo. It also provides broader context. Um, one of the things I was wondering about while reading the book, and there were a few spots specifically that I think it comes up in the book, Lisa, um, is the dilemmas that these lawyers had. I remember reading, I think in 2005, uh, an article by Mary Che, I think. Um, and then in 2010, there was an article by Alexandra Lahav, if I remember correctly, both of whom were talking about litigation dilemmas in relation to whether or not lawyers should be representing people in military commissions uh, at Guantanamo. Their conclusion was that they shouldn't uh, ethically uh, because obviously there's something to be gained from uh, doing that, but, of, but there is the risk of um, legitimizing and becoming implicated in the system. I think one of the, the beautiful things that Lisa shows in the book is that actually to the extent that uh, these lawyers did manage to win some of the war, the victory wasn't entirely about the legal aspect of the proceeding. It was about providing crucial support to the uh, detained people and allowing them to be heard in their own, using their own voices. But I think Lisa, if I remember correctly, it was Jawad's lawyer actually who David decided Fracked. along with Jawad, Jawad right? Yeah, uh, Mohammed Jawad Jawad's was, was law, one of military the- Military lawyer was David Fracked, yeah. Yeah, uh, so Mohammed Jawad, one of the detainees, um, he decided to, uh, at, at a certain uh, stage, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, I think towards the end of the book, you talk about how he decided to boycott, but just be silent throughout the proceedings. And then his uh, lawyer decided to do the same, which is a way of resisting without disengaging from the system, which I found fascinating. Yeah. So I was wondering if you could talk a bit based on kind of, you haven't been there and, and through those conversations you've had with these people, what sort of dilemmas did they have? How, how do you feel that they resolved them? What was the negotiation that they kind of had to engage in mm -hmm. in order to resolve that? Well, good question. I mean, the first thing, you, Hedy, you were mentioning that, you know, the kind of skepticism about whether or not lawyers should involve themselves in legally dubious institutions. I mean, that comes up in any kind of conflict. But I mean, my perspective, and based on, you know, like years and years in multiple settings, different, you know, both in Israel, Palestine, and the US, is that when people are in custody, 
when people are in the custody of the state, you know, lawyers are the only ones who can get to them. And just having that kind of contact overrides the kind of highbrow, high-minded notion like, oh, I'm not going to get my hands dirty, you know, with these things. And I think that many lawyers, I mean, th there's huge amounts of frustration that lawyers, you know, couldn't help their clients or clients who'd get mad at their lawyers because of their own frustrations. But there was something, you know, this process of fighting for for justice, fighting for rights, you know, fighting the most powerful government on earth, you know, around issues of law was something that kind of, you know, even if people don't necessarily think it in the back of their minds, they know that they were like fighting for humanity you know, in a sense, and they were using the tools that they had, and they were putting themselves into an environment where humanity itself was like being degraded, you know, through the law, through government laws, and, you know, so I, I feel like, and in the case you were mentioning David Frack, so he had two clients, one of them was Ali al Bahlul, who is the only person currently serving a life sentence, and his, and I just wrote an amicus, participated in an amicus brief, they're challenging his sentence, but he was the one who boycotted, but then Frack represented Presented somebody, Mohammed Jawad, who was 12 when he got to Guantanamo. And I mean, his case was just a debacle. And Fract, you know, used every skill he had and ultimately both you know, political uh, and legal, and ultimately got Jawad repatriated back to, um, you know, Afghanistan. So like, those are the kind of human stories that are just, you know, th run throughout the book, but really moved me about this topic. Can I just uh, interject very briefly and just say that I think you're right, Lisa, that the dilemma uh, about kind of, first of all, the fact that the law is inherently to an extent always rigged. I think that's correct. If we think about it from a critical perspective, we can think about not just in context of conflict, tax law is rigged, employment law is rigged, criminal law is rigged, and I could go on, the list doesn't end. But you're right that, there's, that there is this, uh, dilemma, and it's not that easy. It's not that simple as it's sometimes presented by uh, uh, kind of some of some critical uh, commentators. Um, but but you're also I, I I know from Israel Palestine that there's a lot of scholarship on litigation dilemmas in relation to the Israeli Supreme Court and the military courts, which you're very well familiar with. So it's just very interesting to see how it kind of plays out on the ground in your book and kind of uh, through the, the the people that whose stories uh, you describe it's very interesting thank you what what were the, what are those differences that's interesting it's like how how does it how how does the fight against torture in america play out different from the fight against torture in israel for example is it does it look the same is it very different uh, there are a lot of similarities. I mean, in the sense that, you know, Israel was the first government in the world in 1987 to legalize torture. And then when the Bush administration government lawyers started developing, um, you know, sort of finding legal excuses to engage in course of interrogations, they modeled their legal arguments on Israel. Um, there's, I think that one of the big differences as far as lawyers go is that, you know, the people who were, just to say, for example, the people who were um, detained at Guantanamo had nothing in common with each other, except the fact that they were male and Muslim. Mm -hmm. And so, and the lawyers representing them, you know, were <laughs> mostly not, you know, Muslim and many, not many, there were plenty of women there too. And so it was just really the kind of the, 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 the experiences of dealing with and learning and coming into relationships that were so far beyond their prior experience. I think that that was something that really had a transformative effect on many lawyers themselves. And they would, they would say that, you know, so I think that that's something that probably, you know, in the context of Israel, Palestine, you get like Palestinians who are representing Palestinians as well as, you know, some Jewish Israelis, but there's a, like a distance that is bridged in ways um, in the context of, you know, people defending uh, those or representing those people at Guantanamo that just doesn't exist in, in other contexts. I think your book actually touches on some of those continuities and connections, Lisa. You contextualize uh, it's, especially at the first part of your book, you, you kind of con contextualize Guantanamo in relation to what Israel was doing uh, with regard to torture, which also raises the question of whether torture as a phenomenon is legal or illegal. And I think it could be said to be both at the same time 
in different respects in the, in the sense that, as Lisa was saying, torture has become hyper-legalized by certain countries to the extent that rather than disregarding international prohibitions on torture, they come up with what they would describe as very creative, perhaps, interpretations of international law. Right. In well, that's why that I always, I feel like them. scare quotes are super important, like the legalization of torture, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but it's also, I mean, even to bring uh, Chris in, you know, like some, one of the things, that, you know, that's not well supported in the United States, contrary to popular myth, is like a commitment to human rights. And, and it was that lack of a commitment or hostility to international law and human rights that was very much the modus operandi of the Bush administration, who really just thought that like, oh, the Convention Against Torture, that doesn't even apply. You know, there was just this notion that you could just will away the principle of human rights, and they did it through the law, you know. Yeah, and uh, th this actually kind of leads into some of the first impressions that I had of uh, your book that I want to ask you about. And uh, since I know there are graduate students who will be watching and uh, listening to this, uh, I'll begin with uh, the one of the most important things I learned in graduate school about how to read a book, and that is to read a book from the back to the front, that is begin with the index and look within the index at the big chunks of text that correspond to particular entries. And that gives you a very good sense, not what the book is about, but the topical nature of the inquiry. And what I found with yours, Lisa, and I, I honestly do this with every book that I read, I go through and see, I sort of categorize the big chunks. And uh, I saw uh, NGOs, took a big, uh, a prominent role in your story. Uh, I saw that government administrations, you know, Obama administration, Bush administration, government entities, the CIA, the, the, those that took a big, uh, uh, took up a lot of space in the index. Uh, laws, uh, you know, uh, uh, the various, uh, you know, detention or detainee uh, treatment act, Geneva conventions, those sorts of things. And then obviously the cases, the important seminal uh, Supreme Court cases. But what I also saw was very striking, and that is the different euphemistic names that we've given to torture uh, took up prominent space. So torture, obviously, the book is about torture. That had uh, perhaps the, the, the most entries. But coercive interrogation tactics and uh, enhanced interrogation techniques. Uh, I mean, that, that almost sounds good. Yes, I, I'd like to have enhanced, inter inter you know, yeah. um, uh, complete euphemism, uh, torture light. And uh, what occurred to me is that uh, is something that you clearly uh, focus a lot on and uh, have wonderful uh, discussions in the book is that there are different sites of these battles going on. Some of the sites are in court, some of the sites are within the law, some of the sites of this uh, battle are at Guantanamo Bay, but the actual uh, terminology, so there's a semantic uh, uh, engagement with uh, the people and the institutions that are fighting this war that is extraordinarily important. And I think oftentimes goes under the radar of the general public and can actually be slipped in so easily and so quietly that you might begin using these terms unreflexively. Mm. And that was one of the things about uh, looking through the index first is I saw you had to use those terms without qualification or square co scare quotes. You had to use the term coercive interrogation tactics because it had become a thing in this battle that was a euphemism, it was a complete, uh, uh, it was a way to circumvent the laws, but at the same time, as part of a discourse, it actually requires you, the author of a book against torture, to put it in there unproblematically. So I, I'd love to hear your, uh, uh, your, your engagement with these terms, and if you, in the course of your research, had to navigate and really look within yourself to see how you're talking about this in a way that doesn't accept some of the presuppositions that those who are, uh, you know, torture enthusiasts, as you uh, <laughs> uh, refer to them in the book, uh, are, are trying to slip into the discourse and dialogue. 
Yeah, actually, it's, a, you know, it, I can tell, I can sort of respond to that ethnographically. So when I first started going to Guantanamo as a journalist, my first trip was in 2010. And um, this was, you know, when the Obama administration had decided to prosecute un you know, unprecedented since World War II to prosecute somebody who was a child when he was uh, captured and arrested. It was Omar Khadr. And so a lot of the journal, and there were a lot of journalists going back then. And so I was going, like sort of wearing a, like an ill-fitting journalist hat, but I was really a torture scholar. And so among journalists, when we'd be having press conferences with, you know, representatives of the Pentagon or whatever, you know, I was just thinking and talking about torture, you know, and then journalists would kind of poo-poo me like for, you know, not use, or some journalists, you know, would poo-poo me for, you know, kind of not sticking to the appropriate script. And over time, as more got known, and as journalists who kept going back and were like, you know, sort of come into my world where <laughs> the world is full of torture, you know, you see the kind of transformation. And so, you know, like really um, professional journalists were, have really kind of, who've spent a lot of time on this, have, I've seen them kind of changing through the constant exposure of what's going on. And so I was kind of feeling a little bit guilty at first, like, oh, I'm not doing journalism right. But, you know, <laughs> but then it's kind of like you see the whole discourse shifting. And that's, I think that for people who know about this stuff and who immerse themselves in it, like journalists like Carol Rosenberg, who's amazing, does, I mean, she's like the, you know, I always joke, she's a national treasure. She still covers every single military commission hearing at Guantanamo. And, um, you know, it's just, it's it's something that, you know, the, the discourse has changed largely because of the exposure and the exposure has come about as a result of fights that lawyers have made and journalists have revealed. I mean, those are the kind of those are the actors that have moved the needle on this thing. I, I want to just sort of uh, it occurs to me that some of our listeners might have been like toddlers when some when <laughs> these stories were developing. So I just want to sort of bring people up to up to speed uh because so it it, it uh, prior to uh the the war on terror that followed 9 11 i think americans so what you're telling me is americans sort of had a, a firmer conception of torture as being torture but once the war on terror began the government started to try to use new words to make us think of torture in a different way so they'd say well we're not torturing these are just enhanced interrogation techniques and it doesn't matter if you hurt someone it's only torture if they feel like they're about to die and we sort of changed the words and the standards and after a while it just got repeated and repeated and repeated to the point where you know we lost our original bearings on what constituted torture or not and i think that's that's what you're talking about lisa and hetty when you're talking about legalizing torture it's not like People said, okay, torture is good, but rather they took behaviors that we used to call torture, and then they started arguing, oh, no, that's not torture, that doesn't count, and this definitional argument effectively enabled torture. Is that is yeah. that an accurate sort of... Right. I'd add what, yes. And I'd add one more layer to this. So, for example, like early on, even before, like in the fall of 2001, after the 9-11 attacks, this small group of radical right wing lawyers close to Cheney, they called themselves the War Council, one of whose, you know, the main memo writer was a guy named John Yu, who was um, a, a government lawyer in the Office of Legal Counsel, who now teaches at Berkeley Law School, um, <laughs> was he basically did Cheney's bidding by reinterpreting the as you said, like narrowing the definition of torture so that it's not torture. Torture is bad. But if it doesn't rise to the level of, you know, pain equivalent to severe organ failure or even death, then it's something else. And therefore, it's not bad and it's not illegal and we're going to do it. But the but the government's position was this was all secret. It wasn't until 2004. Like, so all the stuff that was going on, the authorization of torture by both military interrogators and CIA interrogators who were running separate um, operations, it was only the Abu Ghraib scandal, which again, people who are very young may not know that, but this was in April of 2004, photographs were Public, made public of um, U.S. soldiers torturing prisoners in, um, in Iraq, in the Abu Ghraib prison. And that scandal 
like I call, I talk about that scandal as having a trifecta effect. Like that scandal created a global crisis, but it also created a crisis for the U.S. government. So Congress starts calling hearings in May of 2004, and that's when you start getting officials saying, "Well, you know, torture is bad, but what we're doing is enhanced interrogation techniques." Yeah. And then uh, a month later, um, some of these torture memos, including ones that John Yu had written, come out, and you see exactly what happened. That you know, in the period that was you know it was secret, the government top officials had authorized a torture program, and it had been varnished with legal opinions by government lawyers. And then, so so then, there's a you know one of my favorite sociologists is the late great Stanley Cohen, who did states of denial. But one of his sort of paradigms is that first governments who engage in human rights violations engage in literal denial. We don't torture. And then when evidence becomes so um, abundant that they can't deny it, that's when they engage in euphemism. Like what we do isn't torture, it's enhanced interrogation techniques, or it's the, what they call implicatory denial. Like the government is good, it's just a few bad apples who are torturing people against government policy. But it's, you know, it really was once, and this says something about the US public you know, sort of political politics in this country, when torture, when it becomes revealed that the Bush administration had authorized torture, including waterboarding and other techniques, a sector and a not insignificant sector of the U.S. public embraces torture. And so you start getting a pro-torture constituency. And I don't think it was about torture per se. It's about that torture was one more opportunity for people who have a racist or Islamophobic or xenophobic inclinations to just tie their opinions to this policy that involved in the horrific abuse of others, you know. And so you see that, and, so, and to this date, we still have, you know, probably about half of the public in the United States would support the resurrection of, of torture techniques, you know, mm. and because it speaks so, to things that aren't even specific to torture. <laughs> but Lisa, I'm, I'm really interested in this aspect of torture because there is often this sort of standard debate that asks, does torture work? And uh, that always kind of, that drives me crazy because torture is wrong. <laughs> let, let, let's, but it let's also doesn't even, work. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it also doesn't work, but, if we look at it at a different level and look at it precisely as what you're talking about, uh, does torture work? Well, when Donald Trump says one of the first things he's going to do is reinstate torture, that works in terms of pulling people in through hate, through racism, through xenophobia, and it works very, very well for him as being a quote on for, for, for the image that he wants to put forward and uh, uh, that sort of political calling to certain constituents i think is a huge part of torture uh not seeming weak uh, but then also there's a second aspect of does torture work and that is when the word torture is used does the audience feel a drop in their stomach does the audience feel revulsion? And using the term over and over and over and over again, often I think uh, it uh, sort of desensitizes us. You know, uh, going back to uh, what the, the late 1990s with Rodney King, for example, horrific video of police officers just beating a person almost to death. And in the uh, court case, part of the legal defense strategy was to play the video as many times as uh, they could over and over and over again. The first 20 times a juror sees it, it is horrible, it hurts them. Uh, it makes them feel that is disgusting. That the hundredth or 150th, the 50th, a thousandth time you see it, it doesn't have that same resonance. It doesn't have that. So uh, on, on the one hand, I'm wondering, it seems torture does work for political uh, uses. And then torture perhaps doesn't work in that people don't feel that instant revulsion. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna put this in context because uh, there was a part in your book where I felt that revulsion when you were talking about rectal prolapse of somebody in a black site being sodomized. That's what torture is. I mean, a life long disfiguring horrific injury that we don't talk about. Um, that's what the word torture should feel like to everybody. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on those two issues about the, does torture work? 
was a great point that you make that torture does like what you're talking about is torture does work. It does work in the sense of a verb or noun. I'm very bad at grammar. Um, you know, it, like in other words, it carries other kinds of feel. Like in other words, it's a, it's another opportunity, another discourse for people to articulate. You know, certain kinds of other hating feelings. You know, but when people talk about torture work, the common um, debate about it, and it's it's actually a debate, even though it shouldn't be, because you know, <laughs> the evidence is that brutal interrogations in for the purpose of trying to uh, obtain information accurate information was a total failure an absolute failure like torture for the purpose it was ostensibly used was a total failure now some people will argue no no it wasn't but they are defying reality so you're absolutely right that you know um, you know, I, I, I sort of bring the book to an end by talking about the afterlives of torture and it's I mean, torture is a very special kind of thing, as I talk about, just in terms of what it is and the law, et cetera. But it is the possibility that the United States could one day reju re um, recuperate or renew a torture program is, is not about torture per se, but it's about another means of using violence to degrade and dehumanize certain kinds of people. So, and as far as the, um, you're absolutely right though about the, the, the kind of numbingness of, you know, the, the, you know, people can become numb to these types of issues. And that's why I just hope that, you know, with the book, I tell so many stories stories and, and provide a kind of human face to this that people who may, if they're reading law review articles or more, you know, human rights reports may not feel as moved when they're reading about the accounts of what happens to specific individuals and the long-term effects on them and the long-term effects even on the people who did the torturing. I mean, there's, you know, there's a horrific, you know, um, uh, PTSD among people who were, you know, tasked with abusing detainees. And so it's just, it's a damaging thing, but the damage, I mean, like, look at our country, at this country, at the United States right now. I mean, we're in a, you know, sort of a death, you know, a death dance with, you know, ourselves over like what should the what should the law be? What should politics be? What is good? What is bad? You know, and so I think in that sense, torture is like a mirror. You know, the, the way you're talking about it, it's like a mirror on society. Well, yeah, a, a mirror on society. And I, I've grown rather skeptical of the, in, the, the, the site of engagement with torture in terms of the ticking time bomb, uh, eliciting uh, information, getting, um, I don't know if, I mean, you, you, you talk about the ostensible purpose, but I wanna push you on this. Tell, tell me I'm wrong or, uh, because whenever I hear torture debates, I, I think that's a pretext for the dehumanization, uh, the otherization, the uh, putting oneself up and making one's uh, self feel better, stronger, uh, uh, dominating over another group. And I think the ticking time bomb, uh, I mean, it, it took so much of the air and airtime in the conversation around torture. And I think it was largely a pretext, if not an unconscious psychological, uh, at an unconscious psychological level for what's actually going on. And that is destroying another human being, another society, another culture and doing that in a symbolic form uh, in a dark place, in a dark site uh, where we don't know what's happening. And uh, we are pretty much trying to extinguish another person, another society, another culture. Um, to me, that's what's going on. That, that's the purpose of torture. I mean, you're capturing something like it's so multi-layered and you know, what's going on. So for, for uh, you know, originally, the original thing, if you're going back to the very early period of when, you know, brutal torturous techniques were authorized, the administ the government really believed, you know, they, you know, on the basis of nothing because they didn't know anything about interrogation, but they believed that coercive measures could actually elicit truth, but they didn't know, and this is true of torture more broadly, if you don't know what the answer is, and you're torturing somebody for information, you won't know whether what they say is true or a lie, you know, so that's at the sort of at one level, but then the people who are actually authorized to engage in torture, it's like the same kind of dehumanization that occurs for soldiers when they go to war, they have to be, you know, they have to be prepared to kill other human beings, and so, but in the context of torture, it's like interpersonal, 
battle. It's not like a battlefield. But then what happened, you know, and we're still, I mean, four administrations on, we're still living with the reality that what people said under torture, the government then accepted as true in order to use it against them. And so we are living in a multi-layered lie based on, you know, torture and the inability of the government, one administration after another, to really acknowledge the errors that we made. And so, I mean, the fact that the 9-11 case, five people on trial, including the guy who was so brutally sodomized that he has rectal prolapse um, syndrome, that they, they can't be tried because they were pro tortured by the CIA and, you know, you it's like, you know, people, some people would say, and this goes maybe to your point about does torture work? Some people would say, well, why don't we just take them out and shoot them? You know, but, you know, we're a country that, you know, likes to imagine ourselves as committed to the rule of law. So we have to try them before we can shoot them, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and so, in fact, the government is actually has kind of thrown up the white flag on this one. And they're now engaged in plea bargains because they realize that they can never get what one administration after another wanted, which was guilty verdicts, death sentences, and executions. And now they're engaged in plea bargain negotiations. First of all, it's an interesting point. I'm not totally up on this literature, but I remember hearing something in sociobiology that just scapegoating is cathartic to people. Mm -hmm. Like when they, when they harm rats and then rats go and unleash aggression on smaller rats, the bigger rat feels better. Right. But, but what's interesting about your exchange is it it, 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 it it speaks to why it is so difficult to uh, guarantee human rights in fact, as opposed to on paper, because it seems to me like there uh, anybody who wants to engage in torture, they can keep it running for four or five years by just bogging it down in semantic debates and First you say it doesn't happen, then you go, well, it's not torture. And then you say, yeah, it's torture, but so what? And by the time all of these arguments play out, I mean, you've had years and years of torture and, and blood on, on the hands of government. And, and, and to my mind, it speaks to the fact that like you need society to be on board with human rights to guarantee them. It's not enough that it's just on paper. People have to be into this. And this sort of speaks to Christopher's work, right? Christopher, you you wrote a book. I want to, let me just call it up just for a second, just so we can adequately, uh, you know, give it its uh, its due. So Christopher wrote uh, The Contentious History of the International Bill of Human Rights. And, and it's a book that talks about how, uh, you know, not everybody's on board with human rights, never have been, I suppose, and, and certainly are not today. Christopher, we're running a little bit uh, low on time, but could we just really quickly, can you talk to that point? Some people don't care about human rights. Some people don't want them guaranteed. But most, uh, that is absolutely true. And at the same time, virtually everybody says they do. So uh, <laughs> what, what, what I look at in my book is how you have people who are uh, abject racists, uh, people who uh, are very much uh, against uh, the equality for people in colonial territories, uh, imperialists, uh, supporting human rights, but supporting a very specific self-serving version of human rights that doesn't require them to have the responsibility or the duty to honor them. Mm -hmm. And my argument in a nutshell is, one, the, that is part of a social struggle. And what comes out of that social struggle is a definition and an understanding of human rights that carries with it the burdens and deficits of those who didn't want human rights to be a thing, um, had a hand in naming what human rights are mm. moving forward. And so, Lisa, your work is, I think, very much alive. There's a struggle going on. There's a fight against people for over torture and what torture is, the outcome or the, uh, the consequence of this struggle, 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 years in the future, will be an understanding of torture that bears the marks of supporters uh, of torture, uh, just as opponents of torture. And so, uh, I, you know, th those struggles and uh, those victims and the bodies of those who have suffered is 
embedded within this idea and concept of torture moving forward. And the people who have taken part in the struggle are instrumental in defining it, be it those who want to have torture light or don't really care uh, whether or not we have torture as uh, uh, similarly those who are fighting against it. Okay, could I make a point like, on the question of human rights and like, what is the human? I just wanna uh, do a shout out for Hetty's book on um, children's rights and law. And yeah. one of the things that really, uh, I mean, when I read Hetty's, um, the, the book, Ch uh, Child Law and Rights in Israel-Palestine or Law, Ch Child and Rights, but it was the way in which, Hetty, you problematize um, the concept of the child. Cause like, we are so used to thinking of the women and children, women and children, like, you know, especially vulnerable kinds of categories. And Hetty's work sort of looks at how human rights activists, you know, you know, maintain that kind of distinction of between children and adults, which certainly obtains in many ways. But when you're thinking about children who are arrested and interrogated and imprisoned, you know, it's like that childhood distinction actually doesn't do children any good or society or adults. Could you say something about that, Eddie? Uh, gladly. Um, um... I would also say that kind of linking this with uh, what Joe and Chris were, were talking about earlier, as a critical legal scholar, I think one of the tragedies of rights, and I say rights rather than human rights, because there are also non-human rights, which we don't want to exclude. But I think one of the tragedies of rights is that they become heavily legalized. So it's become very difficult for us as a society to think of rights in terms that are non-legal. Once something is framed as a legal thing, it becomes very technical, it becomes very exclusionary, it becomes often non-radical, uh, it excludes other more emancipatory kind of uh, frameworks or, or discourses. Uh, so when we talk, Joe, when we talk about kind of human rights on paper versus on practice, on paper alludes to the fact, what's that paper that we're talking about? It's usually a legal, like a legal document. Um, and I think one of the things, Lisa, you were asking about, about the book, one of the things I was trying to, to do is especially highlight this problem in relation to legal concepts of childhood, which are often under kind of under theorized and also under criticized. Uh, we, we, we tend to be increasingly uh, critical of, of uh, racialization and, and issues around uh, kind of sexuality and gender and, and disability, but less so in relation to, to childhood. Um, and one of the tragedies that, that I talk about is really the ways in which the limitations and some of the pitfalls of dominant legal understandings of child rights. You were talking, Lisa, in relation to children and women specifically, uh, and thinking about sometimes how sometimes reforms that are done and pushed by the human rights community in the name of international legal standards of children's rights end up actually harming disempowered children as well as disempowered adults. Um, uh, can can so, I just can I, I just introduce yeah. your book just really quickly, just so people know what they're talking about? And then, uh, so Hetty's book is problematizing law, rights, and childhood in Israel and Palestine, and it's talking about how uh, the book. Well, Hetty, do you want to just quickly get everybody up to speed because we're talking about the book, but uh, maybe the listeners don't know exactly what you talk about and sort of the hook of the book. Could you really just give it to us quickly? The book is actually related to how I first encountered Lisa's work because she she talked about her fir first book, which is also once you after you read her latest book, if you haven't go read her other <laughs> books. Um, and the first book is really, I think the the first her first book is really the first academic book uh, on Israeli military courts, which are a fascinating legal site and also one of the central sites that my book is about. And I, one of the central things I analyze is military, Israeli military judgments in relation to Palestinian children who are tried in military courts. Whereas uh, is, uh, Lisa's uh, book, she, she did more of an eth ethnographic research. Uh, Lisa interviewed uh, prosecutors and uh, defense attorneys and defendants and judges within those courts. One of the fascinating things about those courts, when we think about how many people have been detained at Guantanamo since 9-11, Roughly the same number of Palestinian children are tried in military courts in a single year. 
just to give you a sense of the scope of the phenomenon, not to mention adults. So that was one of the key legal sites that haven't been really written about. There aren't any other legal books about Israeli military judgments. And, and the fascinating things, this is about childhood, but it's also about a particular, a particular legal and political context, which is centrally about military courts, but not exclusively. It's about mass incarceration and targeted killings, another euphemism, and human shields, another, another one. Um, but, but really, the, the military courts, I think, highlight very vivid, vividly as a legal site some of these issues we were talking about, uh, about armed conflict and what's unique to that politically and legally. So th that's part of what I was trying to do, kind of interrogate and challenge our dominant assumptions about the law, the human rights, and childhood uh, through that particular context, and then also ask questions about, is that context as unique as it seems, or can it actually provide broader insights about, once again, normal child rights and normal uh, international human rights law? So I, I'm we're, we're coming up on the 75 minute mark. I feel like we could do another half hour easily, but there'll come a point at which uh, my producers will be uh, angry at me because these are, <laughs> they have to cut all this. But uh, I, I, I hopefully there'll be a venue to continue this discussion because, geez, I, I feel like it was not fully played out. There's a lot that you guys are working on. It's a very, very interesting uh, field of research. And uh, it's just amazing to see sociologists taking on really important issues and being conversant with people who, you know, change the system. Lawyers are, are important, powerful actors. And it was just really a pleasure to meet all of you. Uh, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Lisa Hajar, uh, uh, Hedy Viterbo, and Christopher N.J. Roberts. Thank you so uh, much, Joseph. Thank you. Kudos to the Sociology Annex podcast. It's great. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Wait, before we uh, send everybody off, just want to plug uh, next week's episode. Come join us next week. We're going to talk to Raul Perez, author of uh, the acclaimed new book, The Souls of White Jokes. It's a book about how racist humor reinforces white supremacy. And we have two amazing guests and morning from NYU, probably one of the best cultural sociologists of race or just of culture period anywhere. And Victor Ray, I mean, you know, I mean, what, what else can you say about Victor Ray, an amazing sociologist of organizations and culture, great critical race scholar. So if if you're a fan of the sociology of race, be sure to join us. Uh, next weekend. Well, that about does it for the Annex Sociology Podcast. The Annex is a production of the Queen's Podcast Lab. For more information, visit queenspodcastlab.org. On behalf of my guests, Lisa Hajar from the University of California, Santa Barbara. Let me get you on, on gallery view here just so you can say goodbye to everybody. Lisa Hajar, University of California, Santa Barbara. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Thank you. Hedy Viterbo, Queen Mary University of London. It's great to meet you. Christopher you. N.J. Roberts, University of Minnesota Law School and a sociologist. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. This was great. Thank all you. right. So we will see you all next week. In the meantime.